Good evening and welcome. <laughs> President Johnson, Secretary Albright, Ambassador Sherman, our distinguished faculty, Professor Joyce, my professional partner, Takis Metaxas, our Ambassador's Council members, alumni, friends of the Institute, and our 2018 Albright Fellows. Three weeks ago, I charged the 2018 Albright Fellows using the words of Secretary Albright about how to approach this learning that they would be undergoing that laid ahead. In Secretary Albright's words, by definition, learning means exploring areas of life and opinions with which you are not already familiar. Instead of choosing to read or listen to only those people whose views you agree with or those views that make you comfortable, choose instead to study those who make you the most upset. Instead of surrounding yourself with friends whose experiences are similar to yours, reach out to the classmates whose life stories are unknown. Instead of repeating over and over again the opinions you've expressed in the past, stop venting for one month. <laughs> Ask yourself why you believe as you do. Submit your own conceptions of truth to the rigorous standards of critical thinking. Above all, I ask you to understand that there's an enormous difference between entering into an argument for the purpose of winning and engaging in research and discussion for the purpose of stretching your mind and giving free rein to your conscience. Over the course of these weeks, the 48 Albright Fellows, representing 26 majors across the disciplines and 17 countries, have taken that charge to heart. They have engaged our Wellesley faculty, the very stewards of their professions. They have engaged our alumni leaders in an exercise in learning to ask the right questions and learning to develop an appreciation for the complexity of beginning to address those questions. From Professor Stanley Chang of the Mathematics Department, we learned the vital role of math in predicting the course of hurricanes. From Professor Dick French, we learned the importance of studying hurricanes around the moons of Saturn in order to understand hurricanes in our own country. From Professor Doherty, we understood that the role of myth was to model a mode of discourse as a way of raising questions. And from Professor Catherine Moon, we were taken inside North Korea to go beyond the myths, the lies, and the misconceptions and have a more nuanced view and a view from experts from China and a view from folks using open source technology to go deeper and really learn. From Ann Richard and from Ambassador Sherman's own daughter, Sarah Sherman Stokes, we spent time looking at the largely unaddressed needs of the world's millions of refugees. From Brendan Nyan of Dartmouth College, we learned that facts are not very important to what people think <laughs> and don't often change minds once they've been made. And from Z Jonathan Zittrain, we learned about the challenges of artificial intelligence that can't be sorted through with law that he teaches at Harvard Law School. More importantly, throughout these weeks, we have discussed how to navigate the vital roles of truth and trust in today's global context. These are difficult times, perhaps as powerful as anything what the students have been made possible for them is the presence of exemplary leadership, of leadership of character, desperately needed, given to us at the beginning by Sally Yates, carried forward throughout this week through the generosity and straight speaking teaching of Ambassador Sherman, 
and through the enormous, generous commitment and devotion of our Secretary of State to the Albright Fellows that now number 400 who are spanning around the world. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to welcome you. Each and every one of you in this room is who makes this institute possible. We depend on you to carry it forward, and it's my pleasure and my deep honor to introduce you to our faculty director, Professor Takis Metaxas. Thank you so very much, Joanne. Um, thank you very much for, for coming, and to our uh, esteemed uh, visitors and uh, friends and um, um, people who have made this institute uh, real and uh, thriving. I have the pleasure of introducing Paula Johnson, who will um, be moderating the panel. Paula Johnson is the 14th president of Walsley College and is an innovator, recognized the world over for advancing, promoting and defending the education, health and well-being of women. Her critically important work is deeply informed by her broad range of experience as a physician scientist, an educator who is an expert in healthcare, public health and health policy. President Johnson has dedicated her life to furthering an understanding on the fact that biological differences between men and women are crucial to accurate biomedical research and healthcare. By uncovering gender biases in these arenas, she helped revolutionize how medicine is practiced and how research is conducted, touching the lives of countless women. Her research as a cardiologist has had an impact on women across the United States through its influence in reforming healthcare and health policy. Her work's influence has also reached beyond the borders of the United States through the education of emerging leaders seeking to improve the health of women globally. In 2017, President Johnson was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which, as you know, is one of the highest honors in academia, recognizing major achievements in the natural sciences, social sciences, arts, and the humanities. President Johnson is also a member of the National Academy of Medicine, the nation's leading advisory board organization providing expertise on issues relating to biomedical science, medicine, and health. She has been recognized as a national leader in medicine by the National Library of Medicine and has received numerous awards for her contribution to science, to medicine, to public health. Most recently, she was awarded the Stephen Smith Medal for Distinguished Contributions in Public Health by the New York Academy of Medicine. President Paola Johnson is a respected and passionate leader deeply committed to educating and empowering the next generation of women who will make a difference. Please help me welcome President of Wellesley College, Paula Johnson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Takis. Um, thank you, Takis, for that really kind and very generous introduction. I have to say, we are so very fortunate to have you. Um, as the faculty director of the Albright Institute and also as a phenomenal uh, professor of computer science who is interested in how the web is changing the way we think, make decisions, and act as individuals and as members of social communities. And you also, we all know, have a lot to say about fake news. Um, and you bring so much to the college uh, in this very important role. And I just want to say to both you, both you and Joanne, um, obviously the Institute's director, thank you for your leadership of the Albright Institute, um, as well as uh, for all you do. Um, along with your outstanding staff, who, without whom none of this uh, would happen. I just do want them to raise their hands because you are just really um, phenomenal. Thank you for serving as the catalyst for this evening. So I want to say welcome to everybody and thank you for being here uh, this evening. What a robust crowd. Um, and let me echo Joanne's welcome to 
uh, both um, Albright uh, ambassadors, our trustees, our former and emerita trustees, our world-class roster of Albright faculty and presenters. We are so grateful for all that you do to make the Albright Institute a demonstration uh, of the power of an interdisciplinary approach to solving global problems and of academic rigor and leadership at Wellesley. I want to say a special thank you to you, Secretary Albright. Um, I speak for the entire college when I say that our administration, uh, that our admiration, not admin our admiration <laughs> and our gratitude um, to you are truly endless. Um, <laughs> we are always honored to have you return to campus. Um, and to you uh, and Ambassador Sherman, both of you um, have been uh, really um, such pillars and inspiration um, over these past couple of days, and we cannot thank you um, enough. So um, this evening, our uh, topic is in the balance, setting a course to restore democratic principles. I know that the insights of um, our esteemed panelists will offer us new ways of addressing urgent issues, which are significant to all of us here in this room, to our country, and to the world. Our remarkable and talented 2018 Albright Fellows are so fortunate to have two such widely admired and accomplished leaders here to share their wisdom and their experience. We all know that our fellows will be the next generation of leaders, and that may be you. Um, they are outstanding young women from all around the globe who are using this experience to think deeply about the complex issues that we face and what it will take to address them. Um, so with that, let me turn to starting our program with introductions. We are at a critical moment in our country, a time when long-standing democratic principles, institutions, and norms are eroding and under constant and intense challenge. Just last week, NPR reported that trust in institutions that have been the pillars of, the, of US politics and capitalism is crumbling. We're gonna come back to trust as we begin our conversation. And this is only part of the picture. Many of the bedrock values of our colleges and universities, and for most Americans, have also come under threat or have been used to further divide an already dangerously splintered nation. On this list, we can find free expression, the importance of scientific research and of evidence-based fact writ large, the value of reasoned and civic debate, the idea that diversity strengthens us, and that all people deserve universal dignity, women's rights, and women's health. Tonight's discussion presents us with two world-renowned experts to help us think about a way forward. So it is an honor to introduce Ambassador Wendy Sherman and former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. As both Ambassador Sherman and Secretary Albright tell it, and many of you heard about it this afternoon, their relationship has been founded on friendship, mutual respect, and shared values. Supporting and learning from each other, each uh, from each other over many, many years. Wendy Sherman is the former U.S. Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, appointed by former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. She is currently senior counselor at the Albright Stonebridge Group, senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, as well as the Aspen Strategy Group. You'll most certainly have heard of Ambassador Sherman's leadership in international relations. She led the US negotiating team that reached agreement known commonly as the Iran nuclear deal, earning her the National Security Medal from President Barack Obama, among other honors. Prior to her service as Under Secretary of State, she was Vice Chair and Founding Partner of the Albright Stonebridge Group, Counselor of the Department of State Under Secretary Albright, and Special Advisor to President Clinton and Policy Coordinator on North Korea.
She was also the Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs under Secretary Warren Christopher. Early in her career, she managed Barbara McCul Senator Barbara Mikulski's <laughs> successful campaign for the U.S. Senate, served as her Chief of Staff, and also served as the Director of EMILY's List. When I was talking with Ambassador Sherman earlier, um, I think she would agree. Uh, she talks about having a rich and unexpected life. So welcome, Ambassador Sherman. Former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, Wellesley, class of 59. And we have several 59ers in the room. Uh, Secretary Albright is one of the leading figures of her generation. She was the first woman to become Secretary of State, the highest ranking woman in the history of the US government when confirmed in that role in 1997. Her distinguished service to this country has cemented her reputation as a visionary and path-breaking, bold and principled leader. She is the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor presented by President Obama in 2012. Secretary Albright is globally renowned um, as an advocate for women, women's education, equality, and a beacon for leaders, in particular women leaders everywhere. We are so thrilled to call Secretary Albright our own, a dedicated Wellesley alumna whose legacy can be seen in the nine years of Albright Fellows who are already changing the world in so many positive ways. Perhaps one of the most powerful tributes I can share is how often our students name her as their role model and how time and time again they say that they hope to follow in her footsteps. Maybe not all aspire to become Secretary of State, but more importantly, they aspire to become generous and impactful leaders in society. Welcome, Madam Secretary. So our conversation around restoring democratic principles, I thought it would be a good place to start to talk about trust. I mentioned it in my opening remarks. And we're facing somewhat of a crisis. Uh, there's a new poll that was published last week, the 2018 Edelman Trust Barometer. And um, it looks like the United States is enduring the worst collapse of public trust ever recorded in the survey's 18-year history. Um, this is led by a decline in trust in the government and in media. And I think it's by in no surprise, as we think about fake news, as we think about what's in the media regarding um, Russian government involvement in our elections, we think about what that does in terms of its cumulative effect. Um, how do we respond to this crisis, this crisis in truth, in trust? Well, I do think um, it is obviously a basic problem because democratic governments particularly depend on trust. Um, a um, authoritarian government doesn't care whether um, it has the trust of the people, but um, the basis of democracy is the relationship between the people uh, and their government. And I think we are witnessing a very basic problem, which is the breakdown of the social contract. Yeah. Um, and if those people that have been involved in studying fo political philosophy is people gave up their individual rights in order to form a state and be protected by that state. And so there is a responsibility one to the other. And I think that there is a sense that neither side is fulfilling what it's supposed to be doing. Um, the state is not giving the people what they think they need. Um, and there are different approaches to this, whether it's uh, building roads or having a, a good uh, educational system or a health system. Um, and then the people are supposed to be the ones that um, are um, informed about what is going on and either and when they vote they know what they're supposed to vote on but that basic um, social contract is being threatened 
Um, and I mentioned this to the students earlier, but I will repeat it, which is that, um, and I stole this line from Silicon Valley, which is, um, and I told them they shouldn't plagiarize, I can, but they can't, <laughs> um, is that people are talking to their governments on 21st century technology. The governments listen to them on 20th century technology and are providing 19th century responses. So there's no faith in the institutions uh, because the institutions are not delivering. And our leadership is the symptom of this problem mm. in terms of people being left out in some form or another and feeling that whatever governments there are are not responding. What we see is that the lowest levels of government, whether they're city councils or local mayors, they still do have uh, the trust of the people. And the higher you go, the less trust there is. And there definitely is no trust in what is going on in Washington. And what just happened in the last week, I think, uh, really emphasizes that in terms of trying to follow who is right, who is lying, who is making deals that they shouldn't. And I think that that, in fact, uh, uh, undermined even more whatever trust there was. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to be slightly optimistic um, because you all are, the young people here are setting forth in the world. And um, yes, there are a lot of fractures. And in fact, I'm not a fan of Davos, but the Davos theme is about finding shared ground in a world of fractures. And there are urban rural fractures. There are demographic fractures between young and old. In the emerging world, uh, the majority of every population is under the age of 30. Um, so there, there are fractures uh, in terms of what's happening to our climate, um, fractures in terms of technology and its impact on people's lives. All of that is very real, and it is absolutely real that in this country, there's a tremendous fracture of trust uh, and a sense that uh, if you're the folks who voted for Trump, you voted for Trump because you felt no one had your back and you wanted someone who would be a strong leader, even if that you thought maybe he wasn't up to the job, couldn't be any worse. And for those of us who voted for Hillary, uh, we believed that that was the future that was necessary because we have advanced our lives uh, through globalization. We've advanced our lives by knowing people from all over the world. Uh, and we see positive out of that. So we, we have a big shift that has taken place, but we've been here before. And uh, folks uh, here have heard me talk about coming of age during the Vietnam War when our country was deeply, deeply divided. Uh, we were deeply divided during the Civil Rights Movement, as we are in Black Lives Matter today, in feeling that um, African Americans in our country in the 60s uh, we're literally killed on a daily basis just to register to vote. That still happens today. So we were at a very horrific time, and we had a tremendous debate over Central America and what our role should be in Central America that split the House of Representatives uh, during that time. Um, we came through it a better country. Uh, we got civil rights laws. We got a women's movement that had force. And although we are at a totally depressing moment, moment for me uh, and for many of us in this room, uh, we tend to break through. So um, the women's marches, even if they weren't as inclusive as we all had hoped they might be, are still extraordinary. The Me Too uh, hashtag movement is amazing. Uh, what happened, uh, and folks heard me talk about this quite passionately earlier today, uh, that uh, Nasser got 175 years and that 150 young women put statements forward about and spoke, had a voice. Uh, these are all the strengths of democracy, which are the voices of the people. And so my hope is that all of the young women in this room will follow all of the older ones of us in this room to be activists, to find a passion, to do, and we will come through this moment. Thank you. I, want to, I do want to follow up on this notion of, because it, 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 is, it is one of the paths forward um, in terms of thinking about activism and civic engagement. So I'd like to follow up a little bit. And, and Ambassador Sherman, you, you just talked about the fact that we've seen the, the two women's marches. We've seen an increased number in women running for office. We saw women voters, in particular African-American women, 
um, really uh, make Alabama happen in terms of the, the Senate. And the Me Too movement, which although focused um, originally, I think, on, on individuals, it, the, the thrust here is systems change and to create a society that's more civil and one with respect. But how do we really make sure that this momentum continues, that we, that this is not um, a moment? Because um, there are movements. I mean, I think when you think about the civil rights movement, yes, that was a major transformational leap. In the 70s, the women's movement, transformational leap. But we've also seen times, um, I think of the wake of Anita Hill and, and other times when we've made movement, but we've kind of slipped back. What do we need to think about to make this a transformational moment? Well, I think we have to persist. Uh, you know, we watched both Elizabeth Warren and then Kamala Harris mm -hmm. persist uh, when they were told to basically shut up. Uh, and so I think it, it's going to take persistence. You're quite right about Anita Hill. We all thought it was a moment uh, that would be transformational. And it did wake people up, but it uh, was over way too fast. Uh, but it was a necessary precursor in some ways to what's happening now because we understood we did not take that moment and move it forward. Uh, and I don't think that will happen in quite the same way. Um, I've said to the young people here, nothing is linear. <laughs> nothing is step after step after step and you get there. There will be backsliding. There will be difficult moments. Uh, you have to persist. So I hope that everybody here is uh, hashtag she persists. Well, I do think that we can't be discouraged. Yeah. Uh, um, I think that it has been the motto of this college and mm -hmm. of women generally um, that we have to keep uh, moving on this and be united. And, and I think the part that is really hard is to recognize the fact that we don't all believe the, exactly the same thing, but that there needs to be respect for each other mm -hmm. as we move forward because um, I, I think that I, I'm often asked if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. Uh, <laughs> I love and, that. <laughs> um, I worry that we don't understand that we have to keep yeah. moving forward, that this is not something that can be solved very quickly. Uh, it is not something that happened overnight, by right. the way. And so I think that uh, we do have to keep asking questions. And I, I have to say, um, I am so proud of what the Albright Institute has done and is doing. And every time I come up here to meet with the, the fellows, and this afternoon in terms of what they were learning about the questions they have to ask, mm -hmm. and not to be set in one's ways and to be open, um, this is the leaders, a uh, group of leaders that is going to persist. And the question is how you multiply. Right. Um, and so I do think that this is a very important moment for uh, Wellesley and the Albright Institute and for the women yeah. of this generation. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about women. Obviously, we're here at Wellesley, um, and many of the examples we just used are, are women-focused, but we're really talking about change in the broader world that affects everyone. What's, what's the special role? The, the, do women have a unique role? Well, I actually think yes. Um, first of all, um, I have to say that one has to, even without saying one is a feminist, that the bottom line is that if you um, know math and you look at population uh, distribution, uh, in practically every country, the majority are women. Um, and the question is how women across countries can work together uh, and strengthen each other as a resource. Because we know that when women are politically and economically empowered, societies are more stable. And I think that there are a number of different ways that we can not only support the women in our own country, but across the board. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you know, now everybody knows I'm a groupie, and I try to create a variety of support groups. And also, I am chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, and what we've been doing is supporting women across the world in terms of running for office um, and supporting each other and understanding that it's not simple, right. but it. Uh, it can't be done just by American women. And I think that, um, and again, this is such an incredible group in terms of the diversity of the fellows, 
So I do think that one of the charges, we'll talk about that more tomorrow, I think, is that the women that um, are here that are uh, going back to their own countries uh, do have to be kind of the propellers of um, movement and change and know that they have their American sisters, but that we're all in this together. It has to be international. Yeah, in, in fact, I think some of the most exciting things are going on not in America, uh, in part because there's uh, longer ways to go in some countries. So part of the reason that the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, who is pretty much running Saudi Arabia these days, uh, has decided that women can drive starting in June uh, is because he knows that the vast majority of the population is under the age of 30, that the expectations are different, that want, women want to participate, and even in countries where there is censorship of the internet, we get through, uh, and people see how other people live, and how women live, and what options and choices they have. And so things are not going to change as fast as I'd like them to, but they will change in a way that works for Saudi Arabia. I was in India last week, as the fellows know, and um, I give the Raisina Dialogue, which is India's version of Davos, uh, they like to think, um, uh, was on a couple of panels, one on nuclear weapons, and the other was on policy, politics, and gender, uh, with women from across the world. Um, I give the Raisina Dialogue credit because, one, they made sure women were on every panel, uh, which you rarely see at conferences. Uh, this was a plenary session not a subsession. It happened at the beginning of the conference, not Sunday afternoon when half of the conference has left. Uh, it was such a hit. Uh, they hadn't meant to put it on YouTube. They put it on YouTube because women around the world are feeling their power and their ability to move forward, and it is quite extraordinary. So I think the work that you're doing here, the diversity of uh, the fellows from other parts of the world, other experiences, the kinds of work that the National Democratic Institute does, all of these speak to a movement that is way beyond what's happening in our own country. In fact, many women around the world are leading us. That's a, that's a wonderful, I mean, it's, it's so important because one of the things I was going to, well, I, I will ask you, is if we get back to this idea of trust and the crisis in trust, um, I mean, we live in a global society, and how does what's happening here in our country, how does it affect our standing in the world, our ability to navigate on the global stage? I think one of the hardest things to talk about is that. Um, and frankly, I'm very glad that I'm at home here, because one of the lessons that you and I both know that as former diplomats, you don't go abroad and criticize your own country. And so when I am asked, as I was in Portugal not long ago, am I embarrassed by Donald Trump? I answer, I'm saddened. But I think that, I do think that we, uh, I am very troubled by America's position in the world. Nothing, nothing made me prouder, and I think Wendy feels the same way, than sitting behind a sign that says the United States, because the truth is that we have, I think, on the whole, been a force yeah. for good. And I certainly feel that way in terms of my own life, what a difference it made when America was involved and when it wasn't. And so uh, what has happened now is we have been made to look as though we are victims and that we are weak and that other countries are taking advantage of us. Um, and that is not the way I see the United States. And there is a vacuum that has yeah. been created. And we know that in any system, but especially the international system, abhors a vacuum. And so it is being filled by the Chinese um, and now to some extent what the Russians are doing. Um, and it doesn't mean that we want to run the world by ourselves, but I think I'm very worried about America's reputation. Um, and it has undercut um, the way that we can operate um, in an international system. I have been known as multilateral Madeline, but the bottom line is I do think that there is strength in yeah. partnerships. And for us to all of a sudden look as though everybody is taking, you know, the, the statements made are really quite appalling. 
um, in terms of that we are weak. Yeah. That, that's the basis of it. And that America has to be made great again. America is great. Right. Uh, and I do think that it's very hard to have this kind of a conversation abroad, but I do think that we have to say that America needs to be a part of the international system. And when it's the most, it is the most important job of a president, any president of the United States, is to protect the people, the territory, and the way of life. That's the job of the right. president. But that doesn't mean that we don't care about what's going on in other countries. And it's just a statement of fact that America is safer when other countries yes. are democracies. Um, and that is where we need to be more involved. Yeah. I want to thank, thank the <clears throat> Albright Institute for making my stay here, at least over time, a family affair. Uh, as uh, some of you heard earlier, my daughter came and spoke with the fellows. Uh, she teaches immigration law and helps run the clinic at Boston University on immigration and uh, human trafficking. And my husband also came. Uh, he helps to run the Pew Global Attitudes Project uh, in uh, Washington. And in the study that they did uh, most recently and asked whether in fact countries around the world had more or less confidence in President Trump uh, to lead, every single country in the world had substantially double-digit loss of confidence except for two countries who had confidence. Russia. Israel and Russia. Mm. And making up that two-digit loss of confidence is not quick. Yeah. And uh, they had also lost confidence uh, in Americans in America. Uh, which doesn't often happen, uh, and uh, it will take time. And when, as uh, we've talked, since I was such an optimist on the upside, be a little bit of a pessimist now, when we see the State Department, which leads the diplomacy uh, of the United States of America, being not just disrupted but destroyed, uh, it will take a very long time to get the team back together again to carry out the responsibilities of the Secretary. So. Yeah wisely laid out are the responsibilities of the President of the United States. Yeah. So, you know, in thinking about um, us in the global scene and then thinking about how we actually repair the fractures internally, uh, domestically, you know, the, we all know that the enormous polarization um, in Congress is probably some of the worst that we've seen and the polarization amongst the American population is also enormous. I think a little bit different, at least than what I've seen in my life. For the first time, there's polarization, but there's also really, I think, a lack of focus and agreement on just general structures and democratic principles, which is, to me, the frightening mm -hmm. part of this. And, you know, how do we move this forward? I mean, one of the um, issues that clearly is happening in the United States is the enormous economic divide. It's increasing. Um, the opportunity gap is increasing. Um, it seems to be causing clear disruption and fractures in, in the country. And it's fueling a lot of the political divide. What are your thoughts about how we, how we get over this? A well, couple of things I'd mention. Um, one is I think we desperately need civic education in this country, uh, beginning in elementary schools. I, you know, some of us are old enough to remember when we had that, when we learned the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and what basic institutions were mm -hmm. about and what your responsibilities were as a citizen. And uh, they, were never, they were never Democratic or Republican. They were just what it was to be an American. And I think it would do us well to do that again and to put it back into our mm -hmm. curriculum. Similarly, um, although there are many uh, women here who are from all over the country and all over the world, I've said to a number of college and university presidents that just as you send students abroad, send students for a week to the middle of the country. Um, spend a week at a community college uh, in Kalamazoo. Uh, speak, uh, go to the local diner for breakfast and listen, and just listen. Uh, and say that you want to hear and understand uh, because we need to listen a lot. I do think that um, we were, in, in some ways, all of us, kind of overlooked what was going on in the country uh, because we were not 
you know, we talked to each other. And, and I, I did campaign, and driving through Pennsylvania was very different than one thought. Or, um, and I do think that we have not paid enough attention to what technology has done. We can blame the foreigners, but it's not the foreigners. Um, and I think the bottom line is that uh, we need to understand better the effect of technology, which is only beginning in terms of what artificial intelligence is going to do and, and whether people are being trained uh, in the right way. So, for instance, I, now you've heard, I love to talk about my time with Ed Muskie, and I was basically your, your basic international relations person, so I believed in free trade. And he was chairman of the Shoe Caucus, um, and because I was his chief legislative yeah. assistant, I became the empress of the shoe caucus. <laughs> and the only thing I knew about shoes was that I wore them. Um, and he sent me up to Maine to uh, the Dexter Shoe Company, where I met with people that had worked in that yeah. shoe company forever um, and didn't know what else to do. But the um, anomaly was that at the same time, there was a Kmart there, right. uh, and the people went there to buy cheaper goods. And the question is whether people are workers or consumers. They are both. Uh, but I think that we need to understand the identity crisis that people are going through, that they don't have the jobs that they thought they would have forever, and that we are a divided country. The problem happens when there are demagogic leaders mm -hmm. who take advantage of the division and make it worse. Uh, what we need are leaders that can make us come together and do exactly as Wendy was saying in terms of talking about the values of democracy and civic education. And, and what is really a problem is demagoguery. A lot to think about in terms of really um, how we evolve our educational system, which um, you know, I think civics is not even probably taught in most, no, in most no, elementary no, schools no. or in most high schools. Um, you mentioned technology. I'd like to touch on that um, briefly. Um, obviously, we have Professor Metaxas here. And um, I mean, the communication technologies have just been so rapidly evolving. I think we, we don't even know frequently what we are actually experiencing in terms of that rapid evolution because we are so immersed in it. And I'm going to give you a, a quote by Professor uh, Metaxas. He states, we swim in them as if fish in water. That's the, we swim in the technology. You know, they influence what we believe, who we trust, what we do, and frequently the information is wrong. And this same Edelman poll showed that 63% of the U.S. population finds it difficult to distinguish between what is fact or fiction. And that's, um, that's something that we truly have to think about if we are making decisions. Um, how is this technology revolution affecting our democracy, both for today and for the future? I think the hardest part I, I hate to say this, but given what's going on, it's very hard to figure out whether there is something such as absolute truth, uh, because there are so many opinions about things. Um, and I think it means that you do what a wise student does, is try to look up different sources of information mm -hmm. and make some judgments and compile them, but most people don't have time to do that. And I think the part for the perspective of policymakers is the information is coming in so fast, and you That's are right. called upon to make decisions. And so I always have Madeline's verities. And one of them is the first information to come in is always wrong. Um, and so the question is, how do you deal with that? But it is a genuine problem. And I, I have to say that um, if I were woken up in the middle of the night and asked exactly about what was happening in not just the United States, but some country that I've even followed, like Tunisia, for instance, did X happen, you can't be sure. You cannot be sure unless you get a variety of sources. Um, and most people don't have the capability or the energy to do it. Plus, I think what is really awful is the um, kind of um, hyper hyperism, if there is such a word, of news. Not everything is breaking news. Um, and it is really impossible to follow the breaking news and the, the uh, 
thing that's running at the bottom and some reporter screaming at <laughs> another reporter, by the way, right. um, and trying to, I mean, it's hard to absorb um, and it gives you a headache. And the bottom line is, so you either turn it off um, or you try to listen to some other channel that also has breaking news. Um, and it is very hard. And I read five newspapers every day. And yeah. it still is very hard That's to right. kind of compile what is the truth. Well, I think uh, there is an um, age divide here. I read newspapers. I actually get newspapers at home still. And I read news on my iPad or my iPhone or whatever I happen to be carrying around. And I watch television. But I think I would suspect that most of the young people in this room listen to their favorite podcasts um, more than almost anything else uh, to capture news or look at their Twitter or Instagram account or Snapchat account to see what's trending. Uh, we absorb information very differently uh, and think about information very differently. And so part of the trick for policymakers is to understand how different generations in our country absorb information, how critical thinking can be applied to that information. I think the technology companies certainly got a wake-up call and are trying to think about their transparency, their algorithms, who gets to know what those algorithms are uh, to decide what's real news and what's not real news. I think there's going to have to be a lot of hard work in that regard and a change that I can't imagine maybe uh, Takis can imagine it, but I can't right now, but I'm sure it will come. Some people think blockchain will be the answer to that because it will create greater security and allow peer-to-peer -peer conversation. Um, what I don't hope we lose in the technology changes uh, is the upside of technology, uh, which again goes to emerging economies where banking is done on your cell phone. <laughs> Um, where, you know, having just been in India, where everything is digitized, because how can you deal with a billion plus people, um, more than half of which live in rural communities and will live that way for the next 20 years, unless you use technology to create progress. So there is huge upside here, um, but there's also a tremendous difference in how we use technology depending on our age. Uh, and we all need to discern that and help people get educated to use critical thinking for the way they absorb yeah. that information. And I think then that's a perfect uh, transition. My, my last question is really going to be about the role <coughs> of higher education. Because we talk about critical thinking and here we are in a liberal arts environment. It is, it is what we hope to achieve and I think what we are achieving in terms of our young people. Um, and thinking about the role of higher education in our country moving forward and in restoring uh, democratic principles. Interestingly, as we lose trust in, in institutions, one area where it looks like trust is increasing is actually in academics. Mm -hmm. Maybe not our academic institutions, um, given some of the recent goings on, but in academics. And I think that brings a question to me. Does that really, um, is that a call to our faculty? Is that a call to our faculty to share their scholarship, share their knowledge, where appropriate, with the American public as a way to, and once again, it's when you say expert, it's the experts who are speaking fact as we know it. Um, is that really a call for our faculty to be much more outward facing? It hasn't been, it's been the case for certain faculty who've always had that view, but it's not been, I think, the way we've run our institutions. Well, I do think that um, especially Wellesley has the capability of being a convener mm -hmm. of people in the community because, uh, uh, the largest community, because I think that partially, well, the students here know what they're getting, uh, but I also do think that there are not a lot of people that have the opportunity to be a part of a intellectual or academic community and be participants in it. And so I do think it's a way to broaden aspects. I do think the other part that is absolutely essential, and I insist that my students do this, that they, um, we have to make our students argue with their professors um, and, um, and really um, 
question yeah. everything. It makes a better professor, yeah. uh, but it also, um, whenever I have my students write papers, I want them to write what is wrong with what they are suggesting. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to, to understand um, what the contradiction is, what the issues are. But I do think uh, the using uh, an academic institution for community work, mm -hmm. especially um, in terms of civic education mm -hmm. uh, in a number of different mm -hmm. ways. And I think people are actually hungry for something other than breaking news. And right. so um, it is, is very much a potential activity for Wellesley and other academic institutions. Thank you. I think what I've heard uh, from so many of the young women here in the three days I've been here is how happy they are to have discussion mm -hmm. here at Wellesley. That classrooms are not just didactic performances, but they're discussions, they're thinking. Um, I know that in the Albright Institute, people have tremendously appreciated the teamwork, difficult as that may have been at times, bringing interdisciplinary ideas together in one place. I guess the one caution I would say, I think Wellesley should be outward facing, but Wellesley is an elite institution. Not everybody gets to come here. Um, people who are the very best get to come here. And so to reach out to the community is to reach out with humility mm -hmm. and with sharing information, but also hearing what the community has to say, whether that's the Wellesley community or the community of the world, mm -hmm. uh, and m bringing that discussion template to the conversation uh, will be more effective, I think. Great, thank you. We're gonna open it up now to the audience for questions. Maybe while people are getting their act together, let me just say <laughs> that I cannot thank you, yeah. President Johnson and Joanne Takas for, and everybody that's been a part of this. Um, it is hard to believe um, how successful the Albright Institute is. It was something that Winnie and Susan and Betty and I talked about, um, and uh, it's amazing. I, I really do think that I am so proud of everything that has been done and the 400 plus, I wish we could think of some other term than fellows, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but I do think that um, we are a network now, yes. and it is thanks to the support that the college has given our group of ambassadors that are very much ambassadors are the people that go out and talk about something that they believe in in order to get a larger support system for it. Um, and I, I just think that it's been tremendous. And we are about to celebrate our 10th anniversary. Yes. And who knew um, that right. this was going to be such yeah. an incredible success. And your yeah. personal support for this is making an incredible difference. Well, thank so you. I'm very, well, thank, very grateful to thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. All right, I'm now filibustered, so. Um, and, and, it may, and it may be that people have comments on the questions yeah, that comments. the president raised rather than questions which would mean we'd have a discussion. That'd yeah. be fine by yeah. me. I guess I'll be brave and start off the questioning. Uh, so something that I've been really interested in as we've talked about trust and building trust in this community and just building trust among ourselves, I've been wondering, is there a difference between trust and credibility? And how do we build trust? Like, it's easy to build trust when you're talking to someone one-on-one -on -one and you're building a relationship, you're sharing stories, sharing experiences, but how do you build trust between yourself and a community? How do you lead a community and really I guess, know that you're acting in goodwill or make sure that you're always being held accountable and acting in goodwill. And how do you keep that going? How do you make sure that you're held accountable? Well, I, I really do think that is the essence of democracy. It is a constant conversation between the rulers and the ruled or the mm -hmm. people and their governments. And, and I think that it's an interesting issue in terms of trust versus credibility. You actually have to deliver what you've promised. Mm -hmm. um, and it may not look exactly the way that you promised, but it's very important to keep that dialogue going. I think mm -hmm. that's part of it. And the truth is that in <coughs> autocratic regimes, um, you have a one-way, not a conversation, but a one-way yelling um, that is supposed to persuade people that whatever you're doing is in their good, and that's where the demagoguery comes in. Mm -hmm. But I think 
it's an interesting question between trust and credibility. And credibility is required, you have to deliver um, in order to, to have that. The one thing I'd add, uh, since I certainly agree with all of that, is if you're working in a community, if you can begin to listen and start with building mutual respect, uh, you can take a step forward. Mm -hmm. uh, you all have heard me said, I did not trust the Iranians. They did not trust me. I do not trust them today. They do not trust me today. But we did achieve mutual respect for each other's interests, even when we disagreed. Mutual respect for each other's desire to try to find a way forward. Mm -hmm. And that gave us enough space to see if we could forge an agreement. So I would say sometimes the first step is to establish respect, and that does come from conversation, and that does come from listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Grace. I'm a political science major and a junior and a fellow here at the Albright Institute. Thank you, both of you, for being here. Um, this is a question that, for again, for both of you, but also for President Johnson, if you want to come in on this one. Um, we talked a lot about the divides within our home communities, both men and women. Um, but what is the biggest divide that you think we face just as a women as a community? What's the biggest divide within us? Among women. Among women. Um, well, I, I think that we can't expect that we will all agree on things. Um, and I think a lot of the divide has to still do, and I hate to say this, between how some women see our roles and other women see our roles. And, um, and I think that our problem is that we're very judgmental about each other. Um, and so I think that we, I think it would be boring if we were all the same. I really do think that. But I, I do think that the divide continues to be in terms of what are we supposed to be doing um, and, um, and how do we spend our time and do we, because you were talking about guilt, I think every woman's middle name is guilt um, because you are made to feel that you're not in the right place at the right time. And some of it is guilt created by other women. Um, and so, because I think we have a different view of what we should be doing. And so I, I, that I see, and you certainly see it in generations, so. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with, with the secretary. Um, you know, if I look at just what's happened recently and, and some of the issues that happened in last year's March around the, some of the divisions, um, I think it comes down to some of the big issues that we see in our country, which are economic divides, racial divides, and every other divide. Um, that are, in fact, dividing women. What I'm beginning to see, though, on the hopeful note, is much more of a recognition of the commonality of experience. Um, I think the Me Too movement has, um, has brought to light this sense of what women across the board have experienced. I'm not saying this is a positive thing, obviously, but the positive piece is the bringing together the commonality and recognizing the common humanity um, of what we share. And so I, I think that we divide up in the same way that others do, but I think uniquely as women, we do have that ability to recognize um, and come together, I think, more effectively around the common humanity. And I would say the only sentence I'll add to this is that the Time's Up campaign did a really brilliant thing. They put their money on the table, not for women like them, but for women who would never have any legal representation right. or someone to speak for them, for money right. to go through the National Women's Law Center to help women who don't have a voice. And I think that was a recognition that most of the discussion about sexual harassment and sexual misconduct hadn't touched the waitress or right. the uh, person behind the bar who has no recourse uh, or the truck driver who has no recourse. Right. Uh, and I think that was a terrific step forward to try to bridge that economic divide. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much again. Thank you, um, Dr. Paula Johnson, Secretary and Ambassador. And also thank you so much to Joanne, Takis, um, Rebecca, everyone who has made the Albright Institute possible. 
Um, so I was very struck by this conversation we were having just now about um, that not all news is breaking news um, and how perhaps <laughs> um, faculty here and worldwide at academic institutions might be able to illuminate the trends that maybe are hidden by the day-to-day -day, um, barrage of news. So I'm wondering, in your opinions, what is the one biggest trend or phenomena you think is obscured by the day-to-day -day news that you think that people are missing? What is the trend? What is the when, trend when that the kind that is of being news kind of I guess, covered yeah. up? Well, I actually that it is the things that we have in common because what makes breaking news is somebody right. hitting somebody else or really um, an argument that goes on. And so it's kind of boring to say um, everybody agrees on X. Um, and you can't have, what I find the weirdest about news these days, in addition to all the flashing lights, is um, <laughs> journalists interviewing each other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, trying to, uh, it's really panels of, um, there, there must be some word, panels of journalists, but whatever. Um, but I think that what is obscured are the common things, uh, because they don't make the sensationalism aspect of it. I also think that what gets obscured is um, some kind of context that not everything is brand new um, mm -hmm. and that it's a historical issue or um, something that gives you context. So, um, and, it, and it is just what has happened is that news is now viewed as um, really entertainment for the most part. Uh, and not as something that is necessary for democratic societies to be able to make decisions. Why don't we go to the next question, just so a couple other people can get a chance. Hi, uh, thank you. I really want to extend my gratitude to everybody in this room. Uh, I think we can all say that we're really thankful to be here. And my question is, uh, P President Johnson referenced a talk we had from Professor Nyan about how facts are not changing people's minds. And I was wondering, how do we regain trust in institutions when facts are not getting through and there's this disconnect? And I wanted to ask for all three women on stage, thank you again for being here. Uh, I feel like, at least for the people that I've spoken to in my generation, there's a feeling of um, what exactly does it mean to be American? And as people who have been abroad and who have kind of formed themselves within various different contexts, what does it mean to you to be American? What are the ideals that you have seen formulated throughout your life and then that have been reinforced abroad that make America different from other nations? So I just, yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of facts, I think this has always been true. It's just the magnification of all of the media and social media that has so obscured how people experience facts. Facts are facts, but we all experience them differently. Uh, I won't tell the story I told the fellows again, except to say that we all will leave this dinner tonight and we've all been here. We all know we've been here. We know what we had for dinner. But our experience of this evening will be very different. Each one of us will view it through the lens of our life, what we came here for, what we expected, what we got out of it, what we were disappointed in, what we were happy with. So it's not so much that this is some new time where uh, facts aren't facts. Facts are facts. But we have such a diversity of experience and such a division of experience that we are hearing those facts differently and we are obscuring the ground truth of those facts in that experience. Which goes for me back to how we have to talk to each other, hear each other, discuss with each other, have conversations with each other to really understand the other's point of view and where they stand and why they are so anxious and why they are so angry, and why are they so fierce in their support of someone that I agree uh, can be quite demagogic and, and dangerous for our country. Um, and then on what it's to be an American, I could not be prouder to be an American. Being an American is not about who is President of the United States. American is not about uh, the faults we have in our system and the fractures we have in our system. America is about hope and values and opportunity and freedom 
and a hope that everyone has a gateway to opportunity, not necessarily a guarantee to success, but a gateway to opportunity and freedom. And I couldn't be prouder. It has been impressed upon me that if you are live streaming, it is rude not to ask at least one question from someone who used Twitter to ask a question. So I will ask the concluding question. Uh, I'm sorry, would you? Okay. This question is from Lisa Brucken. And the question is, how can young people serving in the military be effective people-to-people -people ambassadors? I knew you would want Fantastic. that question. Good. Thank Fantastic you. Yeah. That's a good question. Well, let me, I'm very glad to take that because yesterday I was at Annapolis at the U.S. Naval Academy um, where um, Vice President Cheney and I had a discussion um, in front of all the midshipmen. Um, and what was quite amazing was that they have the highest number of women um, in their contingents at the moment. Um, and they are studying um, all the normal things in terms of uh, being on ships. But they also are learning a lot of um, foreign policy, a lot of issues. And they will represent America abroad. Uh, and they know that. I think in terms of their understanding of what our society is about, um, and in fact, their desire to serve the country. Um, and I think that that's what I think should make us proud Americans, because people do want to preserve uh, the defense of this country and to be able to represent us abroad. And I do think the new contingents of military really are patriotic, and want to be able to uh, do their jobs and to show the best of America, which is that we want to help other people in other countries, that that is where America um, is its strongest when we are acting in a way. Uh, it is our national interest to help others. And so I think that's the important part. I am very, you know, I describe myself on my Twitter account. Um, <laughs> And I do happen to have at Madeline, um, so, um, which is as a grateful American. And it is because we do have young people that want to learn about the world, that want to um, really display our best characteristics, uh, many of them in a variety of uh, positions, not just the military, who are prepared to go out and talk about what America's about, which is diversity and respect for the other and the Statue of Liberty. I do want to thank you uh, for, I think, what for me and, and for the group was really an illuminating conversation. Um, there is a way forward, and I think that the hope is right here in this room. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. So we're not going to we're not going to leave the stage yet, um, Ambassador Sherman. We'd like to present you with a gift. Um, this is uh, on behalf of the college and the Albright Institute um, and Secretary Albright. It is a sterling silver limited edition pen from Zena uh, pin from <laughs> Zena Jewelers, um, and it's called Fireworks. I can't wait to see it. And we present it to you as a symbol of our shared belief in the power of women leaders, the importance of educating and cultivating the next generation of women leaders and in recognition of your many contributions to international relations, public service, and to women everywhere. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to thank everybody for uh, having me here the last three days, um, particularly the secretary. Um, someone asked me today, did you do this other than the fact that Secretary Albright asked you to do it? I said, uh, -uh. I did it because she asked me to do it. So uh, I would do anything for her because she has done so much for me and for Wellesley and for our country and for the world. So I thank you very much. But I, besides wishing every single one of you young women a rich and unexpected life, yes. thank you very much for being so direct, being so forthcoming, 
and being so willing to share your stories with me. Thank you. Thank and, you for a wonderful And let me add one more thing. I have to say that the topics we're discussing had the potential of being very pessimistic, and I appreciate the fact that actually they came very optimistic at the end. Very often, whenever we discuss the question of technology, people are asking, OK, tell us quickly, is the technology good or bad? <laughs> and as a computer scientist, it's an easy answer to give. The answer is yes. It is an or question, which is true, whether you know one or the other side is true or both are true. So the answer is yes. The real question is, how do you use technology, as Ambassador Sherman said, to create progress? And I have to say that a couple of quotes came to my mind, knowing uh, Secretary Albright. Um, and I will apologize, I will paraphrase a little bit. I will say that there is a special place in hell for women and men who do not persist. So we will persist. Thank you very much. Thank you.